we're going to hear from Hugh Ross, uh, and I'll turn it over to you. Hey, well, thank you. And I'll begin by saying I've written a book called Navigating Genesis, which has five chapters on the Genesis flood. And anyone can get a free chapter of that book at reasons.org slash Ross. And uh, the talk I'm going to give is strictly going to focus on a few of the biblical evidences for the extent of the flood, addressing the question, is it global, is it local, or is it worldwide? And I'll begin by saying this is not a scientific debate, because if it were, scientists, independent of any reading of the Bible, uh, would acknowledge at least some evidence for a recent global flood, and uh, we don't see that happening. And as far as what the Bible's got to say, it's key that we integrate all the biblical texts, not just those in Genesis. And uh, we see, for example, uh, texts in Genesis 41, 42, 1 Kings 10, Acts 2, Romans 1, Colossians 1. These are all texts that describe worldwide events. So, for example, mm -hmm. what you see in uh, Genesis 41 is that all of the countries of the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because a famine was severe in all the world. And yet what we see in verses 5 and 6 of Genesis 42, the famine had spread throughout the whole mm -hmm. of the Egyptian empire and the land of Canaan. So that was the understanding of the whole world of the people at the time of uh, uh, you know, uh, Jacob and his sons. And then probably the best example we see in 1 Kings 4 where it says people from all over the world came to hear of Solomon's uh, wisdom sent by all the kings of the world. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. That's 1 Kings 10.24. And yet what you see in 1 Kings 4.31 and 2 Chronicles 9, that people and kings came from as far away as Sheba and the lands of Arabia. So that again was the extent of the whole world for the people at that time. And even in the New Testament, we see statements like in Acts 2, uh, that there were Jews coming to Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under the heavens. And yet DNA tests of modern Jews prove that no first century Jews uh, came from Bolivia uh, or New Zealand. And you got in Romans 8.1, where Paul says to the Romans, your faith is reported all over the world. And the intent there was a Roman world, uh, not the Aztecs or the Moris uh, living uh, elsewhere. And Colossians 1, all the world, uh, all over the world, this gospel is being heard. Again, it's a reference to the Roman world. Now, with respect to the Genesis flood, there are texts relevant to the Genesis flood that show up in uh, Job 38, Psalm 33, Psalm 104, Proverbs 8, Ecclesiastes, Jeremiah 33. Romans 8, especially 2 Peter 2 and 3, and even the book of Revelation. Again, the principle is before you draw a conclusion on the flood, you want to read all the biblical texts that are relevant to the flood. And uh, you particularly get significant texts in the wisdom books. Job 38, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when it fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place indicating that there are fixed permanent barriers uh, to the waters of the earth. The most explicit text is in Psalm 104. Uh, it's clearly a creation psalm. Psalm 104 takes you through the content of the six days of creation in Genesis 1, and it's verses 6 through 9 that address uh, creation day 3. And this is the day uh, when God transforms the world from uh, the water world, where it's water or the whole surface of the earth, where now we have oceans and continents coexisting. And it says, starting in verse 6, referring to God, you covered it, namely the earth with the deep. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. They went down into the valleys to the place you'd assigned for them. Verse 9, you set a boundary. They, namely the waters, cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. So here we see an explicit statement that once we have continents appearing on the earth, never again would co waters cover the whole surface of the earth. And you see this also in Proverbs 8, where it says he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command. There are three other texts in the Psalms and three other creation Psalms. 
I won't take time to review those. I do want to take time to get into 2 Peter uh, chapters 2 and 3. Uh, verse uh, Chapter 3, verse 6, by water also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. And the Greek phrase here is tote cosmos. And the point here is that the word cosmos for world is qualified with an adjective. In the amplified definition, the world at the time the event took place. And then you also see in 2 Peter 2, 5, he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Again, the word cosmos is qualified, not the entire planet, but the world of ungodly people. As it says in 2 Peter 3, 7, for the destruction of ungodly men, implying that the flood of Noah uh, went as far as where ungodly people uh, lived at that time. Now, years ago, I participated in a week-long debate, weekend-long debate, uh, with three theologians that were all young earth creationists and proponents of a global flood. And uh, this is the text that they cited as an explicit case uh, where the flood waters had to cover in the entire surface of the earth. Genesis 7:19. the waters rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains or hills under the entire heavens uh, were covered. And uh, each of them gave a one-hour defense of a global flood. Uh, I had 45 minutes to respond to their presentation, but in my response, I made the point that you see in Genesis 8:5, after the flood is over, uh, that Noah, on top of the ark, could actually see the distant hills. And then in verse 9, later on, he releases the dove. And what does it say in the context of the dove? As a dove is flying over the waters, and obviously at a lower level above the waters than Noah was on top of the ark. Uh, the text tells us in Genesis 8, 9, that dove could not find no place to set its feet because there was water over all the surface of the earth. It's the same phrase you see in Genesis 7, 19. And again, we're talking about all the high hills and mountains uh, within the view of the people that were living at that time uh, and uh, likewise, in view of Noah on top of the ark and the dove. And a part of the debate that I had uh, with those three theologians is they were insisting that what we see in Genesis 6, 7, and 8 is the word arrest. And it's a word that can refer to the entire globe. And the comment they made is in biblical Hebrew, you've got words that mean the earth, but they cannot use the whole earth. And they made the example, for example, you got the word karaba, uh, which is a word translated dry land. And uh, this could never be used for the entirety of the earth. And the comment they made was this does not show up in Genesis 6, 7, and 8. The only word you see is arrest, which could mean part of the earth, uh, but it's the one Hebrew word you use that can be referring to the entire surface of the earth. Well, they actually had overlooked. Uh, Genesis 7:22, uh, where it says, "All that was on dry land, Karaba, all with the breath of the Spirit of life." Uh, and here we actually do see the word Karaba in Genesis 7, a word that cannot be used to refer to the entirety of the earth. Uh, so this is a word that had been overlooked uh, by the three younger theologians that were debating me that day. Uh, but I'm going to finish up here that. All global flood hypotheses require radical changes in the laws of physics. This is admitted in their writings. And in particular, they need radical changes in the radiometric decay rates to make their global flood models work. And uh, yet we see in the Bible seven places that explicitly state or imply that the laws of physics have not changed from the cosmic creation event through to the present. Uh, one example would be Jeremiah 33, 25, where God says, I have established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. And if you read the entire chapter, God is basically saying to the Jews, you change your mind all the time. But I'm a God who is immutable. I'm a God that does not change. As evidence, look to the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And as an astronomer, I can tell you, uh, we have direct measurements 
of distant stars and galaxies that affirm this text. Uh, Romans also talks about how one of those laws, uh, the law of decay, aka the law of entropy, or the second law of thermodynamics, indeed pervades the entirety uh, of the universe. Well, I don't know how much time has gone by, uh, but yeah, I'll stop right here and uh, we'll take time uh, for questions and discussion. And yeah, having heard the last talk, I do take an earlier date uh, for the flood. I believe based on the recession of the waters, the fact that it took almost a year for the waters to completely recede, uh, that the uh, flood must have occurred sometime deep into the last ice age, where you got a warming event that melts huge quantities of snow and ice. And so I take a date uh, in the neighborhood of about 40,000 plus or minus 30,000 uh, years ago uh, for Noah and the flood. So that all stop. All right. Excellent uh, work. Rolling with the punches there, Hugh. Uh, we have good time for questions. Thank you for this fascinating overview of the biblical uh, material. I didn't get your argument why Noah could see hills from, from the ark. Oh, the reason why is he's, he's had a higher point above the seas uh, than the dove was. And all you got to do is be just even 10 or 20 feet higher, and you can see a lot farther away. And so the dove flying over lower the waters, all that dove could see was water uh, from one end of the horizon to the other. But because Noah was 20 or 30 feet higher above the waters in the dove, he was actually able to see the distant hills. And the point was, he was, that was before he released the dove. So it's just ma basically making a point that when you see Genesis 7, 19, uh, that all the high mountains and hills were covered, that means that uh, from the perspective of these ungodly people, all they could see was water from one horizon to the other. Uh, that text could not be used to make the claim that Mount Everest was covered uh, by 22 feet of water. So, but they it's not able to see that. Yeah, it's not in the biblical text stated that Noah could see the hills. It's a deduction which you make. Uh, no, it actually says that, that he was able to see the hills. Okay. Yeah, that's it's, uh, Genesis 8.5. Mm -hmm. okay. Erica, you had a question? Yes, uh, very nice talk, Hugh. <clears throat> Good to see everybody. And, and of course, I've, I've read your book, but uh, a, a few times, honestly, <laughs> and, and I'm a big fan of it. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, interpreting Psalm 104. So a lot of Psalm 104 at the beginning uses very figurative language, right? And then there's, you know, verses 8 and 9, where the mountains rise, the valleys sink to the place where you establish them. You set a boundary so that they will not pass over, so they won't return to cover the earth. How do you know which verses in there should be taken figuratively and which ones, I mean, you're wanting to interpret eight and nine as rather literal, meaning the seas are not coming over the continents anymore. But a few verses earlier, we have that God lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters and he makes the clouds his chariot. So how do we know which, which ones to take literally there? Well, you see an introduction to Psalm 104. You also see the last verse. But what you notice is everything in between is referring to creation. And uh, there's been a consensus, at least until the late 20th century, that Psalm 104 is a creation psalm. It's the longest of the creation psalms. I mean, as you move on from verse 9 uh, up until verse 30, it's all about the biology of the earth. And so this follows a pattern that we see in Genesis 1, where it introduces the geology first, and then it introduces the life. Uh, so... You can read commentaries in Psalm 104. It is true, young earth creationists will interpret Psalm 104 as a flood psalm, as having nothing to do with creation and 100% to do with the flood. Uh, but this, this is not seen by people who are writing commentaries on Psalm 104 before the 20th century. They all consistently saw it as a creation psalm. And again, I just challenge people if this is a flood story, why all these details uh, that we see paralleling Genesis 1 about the geology uh, and the, uh, uh, the life? But you are right. Uh, you do get an introduction that's a little bit different, although a lot of people have interpreted those early verses as a reference to the water cycle. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's debate over that. I don't see a lot of debate 
uh, once you get from verse 6 to verse 30. Uh, this will be the last question, Victoria. Yes, and mine is kind of a follow-up to what Erica said, and kind of goes to both you and Alan. So you date the, the, the flood far, far earlier. Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence to suggest this may be a localized Mesopotamia flood. And yet you don't seem to use the biblical account when they say, okay, no, it gives the age of all the, the ancestors. So that would put the flood, according to the Bible, approximately, I don't have it off the top of my head, 3000 BC. So why do we dismiss when the Bible is suggesting the flood occurred in the time of Noah, but then dating it way earlier based on geological? Well, good question, Victoria. I mean, there's a lot of commentary about how the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11 are not exhaustive. I mean, you see a name mentioned in Luke that's not mentioned uh, in Genesis 5, for example. Uh, and the question is, how do you calibrate that? And the, the tool I've used is to do it through Genesis 10.25, where it says the world was divided in the days of Peleg. And this is after the flood, uh, several generations down uh, from uh, Noah. And I believe that's a reference to the formation of the Bering Land Bridge. So with a rapid rise of sea levels, the Bering Land Bridge shrunk from being uh, 500 miles across to where you now got the Bering Strait. And we've got a good date for when that happened. That happened roughly 11,000 years ago. And so we got, we got a good historical date for Abraham. So we got Abraham at 4,000. Uh, we got Peleg at 11,000. Uh, you can use that to calibrate roughly. You don't get an accurate number, but you get a rough number. That's why I threw it an error bar of plus or minus 30,000 years, uh, because you only got those two data points. Although I would argue you've got a couple more data points. We know that Adam must have lived during the uh, uh, last ice age uh, because we got four known rivers coming together. And uh, they're named, we know where they are, and the only place they come together today is 200 feet below sea level, basically the southeast portion of the Persian Gulf. So the flood model we've developed with reasons to believe occurs when the Persian Gulf is dry land and you got this rush of water coming in from the Indian Ocean. Underneath the uh, Persian Gulf, we got a huge underwater aquifer that comes to the surface. You got torrential rain. You got a heat event, which is melting huge amounts of ice there during the Ice Age. That provides sufficient water, I think, to explain why all ungodly people living at that time were wiped out. So that's Thank you. where I come up on my crude date. Thank you very much for your presentation, Hugh.